Hi, my name is Hugo and welcome to Hugo's Desk. Today we'll review the PD2725U Professional Monitor from BenQ's Designer Series. Before we get started, full disclosure, BenQ did send me this monitor to test, but just like all my other reviews, when I get these monitors I use them on my professional work. Just for reference, I'm a director and visual effects supervisor working in the industry for over 20 years. I've been doing professional editing, grading, compositing and visual effects for some of the biggest brands and companies in the world. So this review today is my honest opinion from a real work scenario. It's my experience using the display in a real production environment. Unfortunately, I can't show you what I'm currently doing with the monitor because of NDAs. I can only say I'm directing and grading a cinematic for a AAA video game. But I can definitely give you my full review and opinion by using similar projects and footage from other cinematics that are out already. Don't forget, if you want to skip to a specific topic of this review, you do have chapters below. If you're interested, you can also check out my other reviews. So, as always, we start with the box. As per usual, we have a card box, which is great from a recycling point of view. We still have these nagging polystyrene package interiors. I wish more companies would take note of what Apple is doing with their professional boxes. Both the Mac Pro 2019 and all the GPU upgrade boxes are completely done in cardboard. The external design looks very slick and very modern. I like the frame and the very small edge. There's no bevels whatsoever. This makes it much easier to have two or more monitors side by side or even top to bottom. The monitor weighs about 5.6 kilos without the base and 8.3 kilos with the base. Be aware the back is rounded and the base is quite deep. So it takes a lot of space on your desk. You can't really easily have it against the wall. But this is of course not a problem if you're planning a visa wall mount. The screen itself is 36 centimeters high 61 centimeters wide and 6 centimeters of depth. This is without the base. The base is very strong and very thin, much better than the SW and PV series. I've never liked the odd round shape, makes it very hard to keep stuff on top of them. This base on the other hand is completely flat, makes it great for you to have a phone charger or other stuff around. I wish BenQ would make these monitor bases a bit more standardized, this way they would all match. And I do miss the handle. The handle on the SW and the old PDs was great to carry the monitor around. Not gonna waste too much time on I.O., but it has everything you need, really. Did I wish that it had HDMI 2.1? Yes, I did. Would have been great to have 120 Hz support and also proper 444 10-bit quality and 4K 60 Hz using HDMI. This would have future-proofed the monitor a bit more. Not to mention I could have played some games on my PS5 or Xbox Series X at 120 Hz in HD. There's a cover for the cables, but I'm not sure if it works really well. First of all, the hole for the cables is just way too small and it pretty much only fits one large cable. I mean, just look at this. This is never going to work for my setup because I use every cable on the monitor. By the way, it's cool to see a bit of cable management. As you can see, I appreciate this very much. Once you boot up the display, it's really fast and responsive. Gone is the purple boot up screen from the old PD series. The Display Pilot software, which I highly recommend, is fantastic. In fact, I never use the buttons anymore. This is by far the fastest way to switch sources, change ICC modes, tweak settings. It's just amazing. And I really don't understand why the much more expensive SW321C does not have this software. Come on, BenQ, you have now spoiled me. I can't go back to buttons, so you need to make this software available for all of your monitors. The ICC sync is also great. It makes everything so much easier to sync on your OS color profile. It's like idiot proof. No more fuffing around with Windows menus, trying to get this to work and rebooting. The Display Pilot just does everything for you. It makes it so much easier. The screen is a 27-inch 4K display and it's meant for designers, which means it's very versatile. It's like a bit of everything. It can be used for 3D, for illustrations, for CAD, for editing, grading, visual effects, you name it. It is an IPS LED backlight panel supporting 10-bit color. But just like other BenQ monitors, and to be honest, the majority of manufacturers, this monitor is 8-bit plus FRC. We've had this conversation before on my SW321C review. 
Another issue people really get stuck on is the true 10-bit discussion. But the fact of the matter is that most of the 10-bit displays are actually not 10-bit at all. They are 8-bit plus FRC. I'm not going to go into what FRC is and, you know, because we don't have a lot of time. And there's a lot better videos out there explaining this. To be honest, most 8-bit monitors are actually not 8-bit either. They are usually 6-bit plus FRC. At the end of the day, the monitor can support and display 1.07 billion colors. I think the question we should be asking is, should monitor manufacturers be more transparent about this? Yes, they should, absolutely. This is an industry problem. I mean, BenQ, LG, HP, Aces, Anzo, they all do this. All of them should be more transparent and write 8-bit plus FRC on the specs on the website and perhaps explain to people why they have to simulate it to extra bits and what the costs implications are. And at the time of recording this video, the cheapest way to get a full 10-bit monitor is to buy an Aces or an Enzo or an Apple XDR and they're much more expensive than this monitor. 4K is just amazing to have, not only because it's future-proofing, but I mean, I, I can't go back to HD or 2.5K anymore. It's so good to have so much space to work, and, you know, I can also check my footage and my assets at one-to-one -one resolution. Makes it much easier to judge color and to judge qual and also to quality control the edges, to quality control my renders. It's just a different pipeline, you know, it's, it's so different when you watch everything at one-to-one. -one. And I always advise everyone, try to watch everything you produce at the biggest size you can. Just to make sure there's no problems, because imagine if your footage is going to be projected on a big, big cinema screen, anything, one pixel becomes a huge thing. Having said this, you probably want to scale up the fonts on the operating system's level because this shit is small in default settings. I'm getting old now, so I, I don't think I can read them if I leave it in default. So I usually pump up the fonts on the OS level. If you need to bypass the macOS resolution and display options, which in my opinion are very simplified, I would suggest to use Switch Res X. I mentioned them on my SW321C review. I promise I'm not getting paid by them, but I need to shout out because this software is a lifesaver on the Mac. I just wish Apple would implement some of this stuff, or maybe they can just buy them. Surprisingly, the blacks are pretty deep for an IPS panel. I mean, it's not an OLED, but, but keep in mind it's a 10-bit compatible display with 100% color accuracy on sRGB and Rexon 9, so it's, so it's pretty impressive. It's also compatible with various video formats. It can run 24, 25, 30, 50, and 60 frames per second. It also works with YCBCR at 420, 422, and 444, both on 8-bit and 10-bit, with some limitations, of course, because of the HDMI 2.0. Having video format support is a must, especially if you are an editor and you need a cheap reference monitor in Rexon Zone 9. It also supports 12-bit, but of course the monitor internally converts it to 10-bit. This is great, for example, if you want to grade on DaVinci in 12-bit or 10 on your timeline. It's also very good to actually game in HDR with a PS5 or an Xbox One Series X, Y, Z, whatever it's called these days. The screen is very sharp. I even checked it with my macro lens and you can kind of see that it's really sharp. You can see the pixels really clearly, but there is a subtle bleed on some colors. Nothing major, of course, but this is very typical on an IPS display because the IPS cannot switch off the pixels on black like an OLED. But again, we keep saying this, an OLED is so much more expensive. The corners also have a very small amount of light bleed. In fact, only when I push my camera to the maximum ISO settings can I even see it. But of course, now I'm actually going beyond what my eyes can see. I'm like checking this on night vision almost, or even like a cat's vision. Of course, you should temper your expectations since IPS panels have always had more light bleed than an OLED. If you need pure blacks, an OLED is the only way since you can literally switch off individual pixels. Keep in mind this monitor is not hardware calibrated like the PV or the SW series from BenQ, so you pretty much have the factory calibration to work with, but of course you can make your own custom calibration if you prefer. 
In terms of modes, we have a lot of flexibility. We have 100% sRGB, which is perfect for print, web, and design. I always use this mode when I'm doing posters, thumbnails, or delivering print or graphics. We also have 100% Rexon Zone 9, which is great for editing, broadcast, and grading. I mostly use this mode every day for making game cinematics, YouTube videos, trailers, short films, and even cooking videos. It's time to plug my wife's vegan and vegetarian YouTube channel. Check it out if you like good food. Because, you know, we all have to eat. <laughs> we also have 95% P3, which is great for web and phone app development, since most phones use a P3 color profile. In fact, Display P3 is a great choice for design work since it's a combination of DCI P3 from Cinema with D65 white point together with an sRGB gamma curve. Obviously, I'm oversimplifying what Display P3 is, but you can find out more online. Of course, we do have extra modes, but they are nothing more than bespoke color correction LUTs. They just provide you a quick way to change the settings to better fit what you're doing. For example, the dark room mode adjusts the image brightness and contrast for more clarity and sharp details on a very dark environment. So it's great for photo editing, for example. Of course, this is just for previewing or for working. Do not use them for final delivery. They are just here to lift and increase visibility. Think of them like f-stops and gamma sliders inside of Nuke's viewer. It's just a way to test your work and it makes it much faster than switching the settings on the fly. For example, the animation mode brightens up the dark areas without overexposing the bright areas so that you can see the subtle regions and preview your animation in more detail. The CAD mode is very good for contrast in lines. We also have a bespoke M book mode that makes it easier to match the look of a Mac laptop. I find it cool because it's like a quick way to just match your laptop with your display, but I Personally, for my work, I still would calibrate the display separately using an X-Rite or a color meter calibration. The cool thing with this monitor is if you don't want to use the factory calibration, you can go really granular since it has every manual setting you need to perform a very accurate calibration. It even has an option to run gamma from 1.8 to 2.6, making it very flexible and great for video referencing at gamma 2.4. PIP is just the PIP, picture in picture. Still don't really know what the hell you can do with this. Maybe someone has real world applications for this because I don't know what to do with it. It's a very awkward function. Dual view is pretty handy because it allows you a split screen so you can check two modes at the same time. It's very handy to test your hard work in different delivery displays. Like for example, you can check how your client sees a normal hard work with sRGB and also with P3. This is great for previewing stuff. This monitor also has a really cool picture by picture with four different individual inputs. This means you can display four HD one-to-one -one screens inside its 4K resolution. This is very handy if you need to preview four video signals. As you can see here, I have one laptop, one computer, one video reference out of a Blackmagic Ultra Studio 4K, and an Xbox Series X. One little small nitpick is that the HDR does not work on individual signals, so you can really only do this on SDR. This design monitor is both calm and verified and Panton validated, and it's the first HDR400 BenQ monitor that I've tested. And to be honest, I'm a little bit underwhelmed. It's not much brighter than the SW series, which supposedly is only 250 nits, and this is 400 nits. So it's not really making much for me. As I mentioned in my SW321C review, no one should be using these monitors to grade or deliver HDR. For that, you need at least 1000 nits. Having said that, this display works well if you want to preview or just test your grade. I, for example, use it to just check HDR and to check it how it looks on a more consumer-like display. They also work really well when playing games in HDR. As seen here on Forza Horizon 5, I must say for anyone that loves racing games, Forza Horizon 5 just looks absolutely stunning. It's almost for the real at some moments. It's a beautiful game. Really recommend people playing it and I, of course, would recommend it very much to play it on an HDR display like this one in 4K. There is some noticeable improvement on banding from the older PD series. 
it almost matches the high quality HDR from the SW321C. Banding is much more reduced this time. Here you can see it compared between the older PD3220U with HDR10 and this newer model, the PD2725U with HDR400. One of the coolest new features of this monitor is the daisy chain and the Thunderbolt charging. This allows you for you to use one single cable to connect your laptop and still charge it and even use the USB ports on the monitor. It even takes it one step further because you can daisy chain the monitors. So that means you can extend your desktop with one single cable between the two monitors. The monitor also supports a KVM switch for two computers, but I don't use that setup, so I haven't tested it. As usual for BenQ, we have some ergonomic and high care functions. As someone that suffers from eye fatigue a lot and actually has optical nerve damage, this is an amazing feature. It's cool to see options like low blue light mode to help with the eye fatigue when you, for example, just browsing. You can. This is a great function to use for email, web browsing, or anytime you don't need color accuracy. We also have a timer, which I really love this because it just reminds you to get up and walk away from your monitor. You can set up the timer to every 15 minutes or half an hour. This is great, especially for those of you that get really into work, you know, into your creative work and you forget to get up sometimes. It's very important to check if the factory calibration holds up to this piece of paper. Yes, this is the calibration report that comes in the box. Now, according to BenQ, they say this monitor has a delta average below three. But I'm gonna say that a good monitor should always really have an average delta below two. Let's check if the factory modes can hold up to a color probe test and if they actually match to this piece of paper. Using Kalman, which is the industry standard in color calibration and an X-Rite probe, I tested all the factory modes of this monitor, both with uniformity switched on and uniformity switched off. As you can see, everything was below an average delta of three. So like BenQ mentions on the website, this is correct. In fact, sRGB was actually only 1.1. This is below two now. And display P3 was only two. These are very impressive results. Also, Rex 9 was an average of 2.6. I also took the opportunity to test the modes without the uniformity option. This option provides a correction of the edges and overhaul panel by areas so that you have more uniformity brightness level. As you can see, without uniformity being on, you get a bit worse results, but still not very bad. But it seems like that this new feature is actually really working really well. So when you switch on uniformity, which actually is by default switched on, you get better results on your calibrations. The monitor also has something I've never seen before on the display. It has a burn-in cleaner function that helps to remove the burn-in on a panel. I don't have any burn-ins at the moment, which is good since I always switch off my panels, but this function is very welcome if you, for example, have a desktop interface that has been burned in into the picture. I'm not really reaching the 1.2 delta average of the factory calibration report, but let's be honest, BenQ is using a much more expensive Konica CA 310 and I'm just using a much cheaper X-Rite. I still think a delta average of two is very good for a display under a thousand pounds. I also took the opportunity to test the uniformity of the display. I got really impressive results. With uniformity switched on, it passed the test across the board with a maximum deviation of 5% and only on the right side of the corners of the monitor. The rest was either 0% or 1%. Now, if I turn off uniformity, I get a very different story. Then I get much worse results with a range of maximum deviation of 11%, which is not a pass and the rest ranging between 6 and 10. So it's obvious that this new feature from BenQ, they introduced this a few years ago, it's really working very well. You can clearly see it here on this gray image. Look at how much vignetting you're getting on the edges if you switch off uniformity. Having uniformity on is crucial if you're going to do photo editing or grading. You really don't want to be grading with a built-in vignette on your display. Regarding the temperature of the display, around one hour of HDR at max brightness use, I get these measurements, which are pretty good. But as usual on these displays, it gets, it gets much higher temperature on the bottom area. I wonder if this will affect uniformity in the long run, but only time will tell. But I, I don't think so, since other monitors I have have never really been different because of this. The dimensions are all clearly stated on the documents, but I just wanted to mention that the monitor does not go down enough, in my opinion. 
the maximum you can lower it is 8.5 centimeters from the base. I wish you could go more down, just like the PV and the SWs. On the other hand, the monitor goes pretty high on a stand. It can go as much as 22 centimeters from the base. This is great if you have, for example, the stream deck to put below, or even if you want to put a tangent gradient surface below as well. Or if you want, you can just have some pens and papers around. Now let's talk about the power consumption. It's okay for this type of display, but the power certification rating is very low, which is somewhere understandable. This is a professional monitor, so it packs a lot of power to get that HDR400, but I hope that manufacturers of monitors can deal with this in a better way in the future. At full power, in HDR mode, the monitor consumes about 44 watts, and on standby, it consumes about 5 watts. In a way, I wish that it had an actual power button, so after all of that, what are my final thoughts and my pros and cons? Wrapping up the review, let's start with the cons first. The lack of hardware calibration is a shame. This would have made this monitor a must for color critical work. The lack of HDMI 2.1 is really puzzling since 2.1 was introduced back in 2017. I mean, HDMI 2.0 is almost 10 years old at this stage. This means that the HDMI port does not support proper 10-bit 444 at 60 frames per second. And also, it does not support any video format at 120Hz. Of course, if you need 4K 10-bit uh, with 60fps, you can still use the DisplayPort, which is 1.4, or you can use the Thunderbolt 3. Those are completely compatible, and they, to be honest, they're so much better than HDMI 2.0. HDR400 is, like I said, underwhelming. At this stage, I just want an HDR monitor at 1000 nits, even if you have to drop the quality to 420 or 8-bit. But I understand it's much more expensive technology, so we'll have to wait for the costs to come down. Obviously, if you don't use or you don't need HDR, then this is not an issue at all. My final con is the power consumption rating being a G. I understand that this is a professional monitor, but I hope manufacturers, not just BenQ, everyone, can solve this problem in the future, especially now with our current climate emergency. And now for the pros or positives, which there are many. The DisplayPilot software is amazing, making buttons completely obsolete. This type of control should be standard with all displays, regardless of who's making them. As is the ICC Sync, it makes switching profiles a breeze, even for people that don't have a lot of technical knowledge. It's completely idiot-proof. I do like the slick design, it looks really pretty, and it's very functional. Having Delta below 2 on the most important modes is fantastic. This is really a testament to BenQ's commitment to making affordable, professional-grade monitors. The daisy chaining and the M-Book modes are great if you want to hot-swap laptops. And it solves this problem of matching your laptop screen to your monitor. Having all these ergonomic and eye care features is a great step. I hope the SW series can also have some of this. We've talked about this on every review from BenQ, but the external hot puck controller is just fantastic. I can't use anything else anymore. I'm so spoiled now, I, I can't really go into the buttons anymore. Having video format support is a must, especially if you are an editor and you need a cheap reference monitor in Rexon Zone 9. I really like the custom modes like Darkroom and CAD. They are great for quick checks, without having to change the settings on the display. HDR has a lot less banding than the older PD series displays. This is great if you want a game at 10-bit or even a 12-bit. So for the moment of truth, do I recommend this monitor for a professional in the creative industry? Yes, I do. I guess you could say it has my seal of approval. And to be honest, I'm using the display in my office with my professional work already. I would not use the monitor if I thought it was not good. And that is it for today. Sorry for the long video, but there was a lot to say. As always, if you like my content, maybe consider subscribing to the channel. It is completely free. And if you really like my videos and the podcast, maybe join my Patreon or become a member on YouTube. You get early access, you get your name on the end credits, among other perks. I hope you have a great day and I'll see you on the next video.